folks, and welcome back to FPS Time. In this episode, due in most part by special request from Shasta here, we're going to be taking a gander at the original Xbox classic, Halo. I'm ready, Shasta boy. Oh, uh, would you mind if I were to talk about the history behind the game and such? Alrighty then. Well, before we get to the tale behind the development of Halo, I should briefly go over the console that it was released exclusively on. The original Microsoft Xbox is a big son of a gun. It's like the Hummer of video game consoles, and I've compared them, and the original Xbox is actually bigger and heavier than the Xbox One, though not as big nor possibly as heavy as the Sega Genesis CD32X combo console. But to be perfectly honest, there is a reason behind the original Xbox's near behemoth size. You see, inside the console, right here, I think, is a fairly large hard drive. The hard drive was put in there so that games could be saved on the Xbox itself, rather than having to deal with external memory cards. Even though there were external memory cards released for the console, Another reason for the size was the power supply. You know how some consoles have the, this brick thing on the AC cord? Well, the original Xbox has the brick inside. Another thing that's big about this console is its controller. Let me just show you. More specifically, its initial release controller, nicknamed the Duke. This controller is massive. It's not as heavy as it might look, but it's still big. The Duke, however, got a lot of negative feedback due to its size. Eventually, Microsoft started selling the console with the smaller controller S that was released for the Xbox in Japan. I myself tend to like the Duke controller more, but then again, I have big hands, so this controller fits comfortably into my palms. Chasta, not in front of the audience. Anyway, the original Xbox was big and it had the capabilities to match, but it needed a killer app to show for it. Enter Halo Combat Evolved, or as I like to call it, Halo 1. Microsoft was pitting themselves against two well-established giants in the console biz, Nintendo and Sony, and they needed an exclusive, something unique that would not only wow folks, but would also show what their new console was capable of doing. One of these days, I'll go over the original Xbox in greater detail, but now I think it's time that I talk about Halo. So, let's take a little trip down history lane. Now, we really can't talk about Halo without talking about the company that developed it, Bungie. Now, Bungie itself was founded by these two gentlemen here, Jason Jones, and Alex Seropian. Both these guys were computer game developers, but their games, for the most part, were made not for the Windows PCs, mind you, but rather the Apple Macintosh line of computers. The first game that the company developed was a dungeon crawler titled Minotaur, The Labyrinths of Crete. The game only sold about two and a half thousand copies, but it gained a dedicated cult following. Minotaur was followed by Pathways into Darkness, a first-person shooter and adventure game. Now, here's where the story gets interesting. Pathways was not only the game that put Bungie on the map as a great team of video game developers, but it also showed that the Apple brand of computers were competent as gaming machines. This notion led Bungie to develop their first magnum opus, Marathon. Now, this game is a tried-and-true 90s FPS classic. You could basically call it a spiritual predecessor to Halo, the look and feel of this game alone should be enough to drive that fact home. Marathon was met with very high praise, especially among Mac gamers. After the success of Marathon, Bungie would go on to make other games throughout the 90s. 
1999, Bungie was hard at work developing what would eventually become Halo. Originally, Halo was going to be released as a Mac and PC game. However, in the year 2000, Microsoft ended up purchasing Bungie and they made them a second party developer. At this point, Bungie focused Halo's development on the Xbox rather than on the Mac and PC. Granted, there was a PC version of Halo released after the original Xbox version. By the Christmas season of 2001, both the original Xbox and Halo were launched to critical acclaim. On its initial release, Halo broke sales records. Eventually, the game sold a whopping 5 million copies worldwide. What's more is that Halo was not only a killer app responsible for half the sales of a burgeoning new console, but it was also a turning point in FPS history. You see, up until Halo, most first-person shooters were geared towards PC gamers, and thus, most of the time, they were released exclusively for the PC. The reason behind that was because consoles were quite limited, and for a long time they just simply didn't have the processing power to handle many FPS games. Halo showed the world that not only could consoles now handle the specs needed to run an FPS game, but they could also become a hot seller, and thus first-person shooters started to immigrate from computers to consoles. One of these days I'll do an episode on the history of FPS games. I think it's time though that we dig into the main course of this review. Oh, um, one more thing. I am well aware of Halo's multiplayer, but I'm not gonna talk about it. Firstly, because the servers for the game have been down for years, and secondly, Shasta and I play Halo mostly for the story anyway. Alrighty then. What say you, Shasta? You ready to go kick some Covenant ass? Damn right! The moment we start the game, two of five sensors are hit with good sensations. The look and the sound. Well shit, that didn't take long. We've just turned it on and already Halo is pulling out the big guns. For 2001 as well as 6th gen game standards, Halo looks like something bestowed upon us by Jesus. And I could tell y'all why that is. Microsoft wanted to show that their console was ahead of the game, no pun intended, when it came to visuals, versus the graphics seen on the likes of the PS2 and the GameCube. <laughs> Sure thing, Shasta. So in terms of graphics, Halo is the equivalent of a Playboy Bunny of the Year centerfold. It's just eye candy. So that's the visuals, but then there's the sound of the game, and that's another thing worth mentioning. When it comes to music, Halo has got its groove on. The tunes in this game range from being operatic symphonic metal to dark ambient. Here are a couple examples.
That's correct, Shasta. And the game has one hell of a tale to tell. The plot of Halo goes like this. It is the 26th century. Lightspeed has made it possible for humanity to colonize space. During this time, the nations of Earth unite under a unified government called the United Nations Space Command. 27 years prior to the events in this game, a collective of aliens calling themselves the Covenant begin waging a holy war against humans and start attacking their colonies. 27 years later, and the war has reached a stalemate, with neither the UNSC nor the Covenant gaining any ground. Eventually, a UNSC battlecruiser called the Pillar of Autumn discover a ring-shaped space station called Halo. However, the Autumn has been pursued by the Covenant ever since they went into hyperspace, and it's only a matter of time before they begin an assault. The commander of the Autumn vessel, Captain Keyes, initiates the Cole Protocol, an order in which all navigation data is erased and is designed to prevent the Covenant from learning the location of Earth. It's here that we're introduced to the game's main protagonists, Master Chief and Cortana. Master Chief is a genetically enhanced super soldier fighting for the UNSC, and as you'd expect, his behavior reflects that of a hard-as-nails, emotionally reserved, and disciplined marine. Cortana is a highly advanced AI created by the UNSC for military purposes, though she could also be described as an info collector of sorts for the human creators. If I could describe her personality in any way, I would say that she's on par with a civilian military instructor, kind of like the character Charlie Blackwood from the movie Top Gun. So after being woken up from hypersleep, Master Chief is given orders from Keys to protect Cortana at all costs and abandon the Autumn. Now on the space station Halo, Master Chief, along with the assistance of Cortana, as well as some UNSC Marines, engage the enemy Covenant forces and try to figure out what the purpose of the Halo is. <laughs> Gotta agree with y'all on that one, Shast. It is a pretty epic story. The guns that are used in Halo are quite unique, and each one delivers a punch. The weapons can be broken up into two categories, firearms that are used by the UNSC and firearms that are used by the Covenant. The UNSC uses guns that fire bullets, whilst the Covenant uses guns that fire projectiles of energy. Let's start with the UNSC weapons. The first one that we're given is the M6D pistol. Despite being just a handgun, it's pretty damn effective. Seriously, this gun can take down even the bigger enemies with like five or six shots. It's a good gun. The next weapon, and possibly the most iconic in the Halo franchise, is the MA-5B assault rifle. This firearm is great against the Covenant forces, but when it comes to the Flood, God, they just seem to be like bullet sponges for this weapon. Moving down the list, we get the S2 sniper rifle. As with any sniper rifle, the point is to go to a vantage point and pick off enemies one by one. It's a great gun, but there's a catch to it. You see, ammo for the S2 is quite scarce, and that could all be attributed to the fact that this rifle is basically an aim and kill gun. Coming in next is the M90 shotgun. This happens to be my favorite weapon of the UNSC. Since it's a shotgun, it's pretty much required that you get up close and personal with the enemies, but it's hella effective. Usually taking down a target, be it Covenant or Flood, with just two to three shots. Also, ammo isn't too hard to come by for it. The final weapon that the UNSC has at their disposal is the Rocket Launcher. You can pretty much call this the BFG of Halo 1. Whatever you aim this gun at, it kills. Also, the splash damage of the rocket launcher is quite devastating. If any enemies are close to the specific target, then there's a pretty high chance that they're going to end up dead. Well, that was the UNSC weapons, so let's see what the Covenant has to offer. The first Covenant firearm on the list is the Plasma Pistol, or as I like to call it, the Mega Man Pistol. 
No, I wasn't kidding about the Mega Man bit. This gun can actually be charged up, just like Mega Man's arm cannon. And the charge shot is a one kill shot. Great gun. The next Covenant weapon is the Needler. I kinda have a love-hate relationship with this particular firearm. I love the fact that it shoots a semi-homing projectile, and I also like that it doubles as a melee weapon. But here's the thing, the projectiles, which are crystals I guess, do not explode upon contact. They embed themselves into a target first, and then they explode, giving the enemy ample time to retaliate and hurt you. Also, and this just might be nitpicking, whenever I use this gun, the crystals seem to just miss a lot. Oh, but when the Covenant or Flood are using it against you, it has near perfect accuracy. And finally, we have the Plasma Rifle. You thought the UNSC were the only guys packing an assault weapon? Well, here's the motherfucking Plasma Rifle. I fucking love this gun. It may not be the most powerful firearm that you can wield, but it definitely is one of the most effective. Firstly, it fires a continuous shot of energy beams. And secondly, it's effective against both the Covenant and the Flood alike. Another good thing about this gun is that it's fairly easy to come by. Usually it's dropped by Covenant forces, but the Flood can also be carrying it. Man, oh man, that was quite a few weapons to go through, Shast. <laughs> At least in my opinion, is one of those games that gamers in general have played at least once before. Kind of like Super Mario Brothers or maybe even Pac Man. Another awesome feature that Halo offers to players is the vehicles. In all, there are four, two used by the UNSC and two used by the Covenant. The first vehicle that you get to ride around in is the Warthog. Possibly the most iconic ride in the franchise, the Warthog seats three people, including the driver. This vehicle also sports a machine gun for defense. It's a good ride, but there is a drawback. Its handling is kind of questionable. It kind of seems like you're driving around in a miniature tank. It's fast, that's for sure, but Jesus does this thing need a lot of room to turn. The next little vehicle that you saddle on is the Covenant Ghost. If I could describe this thing in any way, I'd say it's Halo's version of the speeder bikes from the Star Wars franchise. The Ghost is a one-man ride, but it's much more maneuverable than the Warthog. This thing also has two plasma cannons in the front, making it a full-on assault vehicle. Now here's the big one, the UNSC Scorpion Tank. Now as you'd imagine, this baby is strong and slow, and it is fucking awesome to ride around in. As with any tank, it has a cannon, but it also has a machine gun, which, by the way, doesn't require an NPC to use and fire like the Warthog. The Scorpion can also seat up to six Marines on its tread covers, giving you that extra cover when taking on enemies. The Covenant trembles before the might of the mighty Scorpion tank. Though there is one downside to it. You can only drive the Scorpion once in the entire game. I can understand why Bungie did that. Firstly, the tank is OP, and when you get other marines on board, it just becomes even more OP. 
I wasn't kidding when I said that the Covenant fears this thing. Another possible reason why Bungie only let you use the Scorpion once was because of the sheer size. It's a tank, so it has every reason to be big. But most of the areas of which you fight on are not exactly open. I mean, they're not teeny tiny either, but they're not really big enough to have something like this being ridden around in. That's probably why the area where the Scorpion is introduced is fairly open compared to the other battle areas. And the final vehicle that we get to drive in is the Covenant Banshee. This happens to be the only flying vehicle in Halo 1. Once you hop on in the Banshee, taking out enemies on the ground becomes a breeze. Also, this vehicle is surprisingly maneuverable. Though, in terms of durability, the Banshee is quite lacking. Being that it's a flying vehicle, that kind of makes sense. However, the enemies seem to hate it whenever you decide to use one of these, and they will try their damnedest to bring it down. So, word of warning, never stop moving once you're in the Banshee. Until the enemies are dead, that is. <laughs> That is a really cool feature for Halo 1. I've been only mentioning them so far in this review, but it's time that I actually go over some of the enemies that you'll have to fight in this game. One of the first baddies that we come across are the Grunts. You'll be seeing these little shits everywhere pretty much throughout the game. They're pretty cowardly though. They usually run away at the first sight of any trouble. Despite their seeming gutlessness, the Grunts will shoot back at you. They can be troublesome little buggers too, especially when they're in a group, which by the way, they almost always are. But it turns out that the grunts are actually the funniest characters in the game. They have high-pitched cartoony voices, and watching them scurry away from a firefight is just hilarious. I guess you could say they're like the midget clowns of the game. Another prominent enemy that you'll be seeing throughout Halo 1 are the Elites. Oh, how do I describe the Elites? Imagine, if you will, some mad scientist spliced together the DNAs of Ivan Drago from Rocky IV, a predator, and then added the vicious disposition of a honey badger for good measure. Well, that's the elites, folks. And yes, they are as badass as that sounds. Unlike the spineless grunts, the elites will charge headlong into battle. Also, they're pretty smart. They will actively strafe around your gunfire to avoid getting hit. They also have a particle shield surrounding them, meaning that it's going to take a few shots, no matter which weapon you're using, to take them down. Tough and stubborn, the elites are the backbone of the Covenant, and it's more than likely that they'll kill you more times than any other enemy. Next up in the Covenant forces are the Jackals. The Jackals are basically the middlemen of the Covenant. They're not as strong as the Elites, but they're definitely stronger than the Grunts. These guys carry a riot shield around with them, meaning that you usually have to get up close and personal with them. Their riot shield are not completely invulnerable, though. If you have the plasma pistol or the plasma rifle, you can whittle their shields down to nothing. These guys usually carry around plasma pistols, and more often than not, they'll charge it before firing, so approach them with caution. Finally, we have the Hunters. Don't let their slowness fool you. They're big, bad, and dangerous. They don't show up too often, but when they do, be prepared to pump their guts full of lead. The best weapon to use against the Hunters is the Rocket Launcher, which usually conveniently turns up whenever they do. Usually, one shot from the launcher is enough to take them down. However, if you don't have the rocket launcher, then your best strategy is to use whatever weapon you have available and just run circles around the hunters whilst shooting. So that was the Covenant forces, but there are also two other enemies that you'll be fighting throughout the game as well. 
Those two enemies include the Flood and the Sentinels. The Flood are parasitic enemies that you'll encounter by the middle of the game. Unlike the Covenant, the Flood are... pretty stupid. I mean, they're smart enough to use a gun, don't ask me how, but unlike the Covenant forces that use some tactics, the Flood only know how to charge at you, damn whatever's in their way. The Flood rely on sheer numbers to overwhelm you in battle. One interesting thing about these guys is that they take over the body of whatever poor life form was unfortunate enough to come into contact with them. Also, they look like something straight out of an HP Lovecraft novel. I like the way Bungie made the Flood look. May they haunt your dreams forever. <laughs> The last enemy on the list are the Sentinels. The Sentinels are flying robots that guard the inner structures of the Halo. Initially, they're friendly, only attacking the Flood, but eventually they become hostile, attacking anything and everything that crosses their path. They're not exactly strong, though. I mean, sure, their laser is kind of strong, but other than that, a few shots from any weapon and they're down like flies. Not much to be said about the Sentinels, just another enemy to kill with impunity. So we've gone over some of the major features of Halo 1, now let's briefly go over some of the minor features. Halo 1 was one of the precursors to regenerating health in shooter games. Right when you start the game, Master Chief is given a particle shield. The shield regenerates, meaning that if you take a fair amount of hits, you can back off for a while and let the shield recharge. You do have normal health, and you can also find med kits in case your health gets too low. But the particle shield gives you a bit of an edge. Kill some enemies, take a few hits, fall back so your shield can regenerate, rinse, repeat. This makes Halo 1 flow nicely. One other minor feature in this game is your jump. A moon jump at that. You see, there is some platforming in Halo 1. Not much, in fact very little. But what little platforming there is, it's required that you have a fairly good jump. The Halo series is the only franchise of FPS games that I know of where you have a jump like this. I think it's really cool, adding even more character to what's already a pretty noteworthy title. Okay, I think Shasta and I have gone over pretty much all that we could. But before I give Halo its final grade, let me share my final thoughts with you. Halo 1 is a very solid game, but like any game, there are some negatives to be had. One of the things that I really would have loved to have seen in this game was a map. In the later levels, it's actually pretty easy to get lost because you're never given any indication on where you need to go. This problem is especially prevalent in the levels with corridors and hallways. It's not uncommon to find yourself wandering around in circles. Another issue, and as Shasta mentioned, is some of the ridiculous shit that the Flood pull. Like coming up from behind and bushwhacking you. It's enough to really irk you. You'll be preoccupied fighting a half dozen or so Flood enemies in front of you, only for another half dozen Flood to attack from behind you. And yeah, that is cheap. But these issues are really not all that bad. Not for me, at least. And they don't really detract from all the really good stuff that the game has to offer, like the sprawling battlefields, the engaging story, and, lest we forget, the sweet-ass vehicles. Halo 1 was not only the beginning of a great FPS franchise, but it was also the game that made the Xbox a household name. It was the game that gave the console a foothold in the industry. Halo was also the game that led up to another franchise that I really love, the Gears of War games. Personally, I believe that if not for Halo, we possibly wouldn't have gotten this phenomenal series. Well, after evaluating Halo 1's performance, I'm going to go ahead and give it an E for excellent. 
It's just a great title, and I think everybody should play it. Even if you're not into FPS games too much, give it a go. You may find yourself falling in love with not only the game, but the franchise in general. However, I think that I should mention this. Now, to me, the game has aged quite well. And mind you, in terms of games aging, I try to put into perspective that whichever game came out in a certain generation, they're going to be a product of their time. But not all gamers think like me. And some believe that Halo 1 hasn't aged so good. So I got the good old D-Lapse to give a second opinion. Okay, Dylan, you're on. Hello everybody, it's D-Lapse. I'm here to review Halo on Xbox. Now I was excited at first to play this until I realized this isn't the Halo that I actually enjoyed. I enjoyed actually playing Halo 3. That was the Halo game I enjoyed the best and I thought is the best. Now playing Halo after such a huge hiatus felt so foreign to me. Basically the controls, I just couldn't get used to it. Clicking the analog to zoom, uh, it, just the way the characters feel, like they kind of feel floaty. I'm not a fan of like this style. I, I basically think Call of Duty made the best control schemes for first person shooters available, and this feels like very alpha, beta controlish schemes to me. I, I just didn't like the old style feel to it. I like the new Halo, the newest Halo's controls. It feels like Call of Duty. Now let's talk about the graphics, man. I think the graphics actually hold up pretty well. Everything just looks all fuzzy. I felt if this was put on a cell phone, it would really be cool. But they have the new version that came out also on Xbox One, which I'm sure they fixed all the graphics. But playing this again, it, it basically just feels like you have fuzzy glasses on. One thing that's a huge plus about Halo are the environment and the rideable vehicles. I would have to say it's the funnest part of the game. The characters and the enemies, everybody has so much room to run around and do what they need to do. The computer AI r works really well. But one thing I would have to say is a huge fucking dud about this game is the story. It's crappy. The characters look terrible. The character models move. The animation looks fucking stiff as fuck. It's terrible, man. The story itself is fucking dumb and boring. Everything that they talk about is boring. Everything, all your missions are boring. You know what I mean? Basically, just go to the next area and clean them out. That's all it is. But still, the gameplay is fun. But the story, man, I, I always hated the Halo story. And I don't think I'm a hater about this whole shit. I'm a huge fan of Halo 3. Check this out. This is my stats online. I played a lot of fucking games online. I liked Halo 3 for the online. I never liked Halo for the story. I can, I can tell you that right now. This one, it was a drag to play through it. I, I really didn't enjoy the fact that I had to go through a cutscene that I didn't want to watch or hear uh, another thing of dialogue from from uh, a character I didn't want to hear from. So honestly, I'm going to have to give this game, if I had to be straight out and be like honest about shit, I'm going to give it a 4. This isn't my Halo. I'm not a Halo guy. I, honestly, a Halo really isn't my series. You know, I'm a Mass Effect, you know, I like Dead Space. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a dick, I'm sorry. I'm a dick, I know, okay, anyway. Thank you very much, Redneck, for letting me do a second opinion on Halo. And everybody, please subscribe to Redneck's channel. Have a great one. Thank you, Dylan. I appreciate you giving your opinions. They're not only welcomed, they're needed. Yeah, me too. Anyway, we got one more review for FPS time to go, folks. And, uh, not really looking forward to it. Uh, see you guys in the next review.